Hi, I'm John, the only banking systems engineer, Termel. And uh, in 1979, I ran for parliament to legalize gambling. I'm a professional poker player, got tired of being busted. And they asked me about inflation. And I said, how come the government's chips inflate and my casino chips do not? And I did my first engineering analysis of the money system. I realized that they were lying to us when they said that interest fights inflation. I realized that interest causes inflation. And so over the next nine months, I studied everything I could on economics and money and banking. And then uh, about nine months later, another election was called after the Joe Clark government was brought down and in that election Pierre Trudeau came back and I wrote this as my handout for that 1980 election so this was called the watch it's a hustle and watch it's a hustle January 26 1980 29 years ago by John Termel my first engineering analysis of the banking system Bankers and economists tell us that they've been fighting with inflation, wrestling with it. The truth's out. They've been dancing with it to the watch it's a hustle. They tell us that they use interest to fight inflation. That's not true. Interest causes inflation. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association complained to the Commons Finance Committee that, quote, the current interest rates are themselves inflationary, adding to the cost of Canadian produce goods and the risk of doing business, unquote. These interest costs are passed right along to the consumer in a direct component of inflation. And since more producers are put out of work due to the increased risk, there are fewer goods produced and the prices are again bid up in price. They note, quote, that the answer to inflation lies in increased productivity and the current monetary policy works in direct opposition to this central objective. The root problem is our productive capacity. Lower interest rates would allow expansion of plant capacity and productivity. The policy enunciated by the Bank of Canada is flawed on every front. It is preoccupied with using a few puny levers in bank policy and not looking at the whole engine. It's like fiddling with the instrument panel of one's car and not recognizing that the carburetor's fouled, the battery's weak, and the gas gauge is registering empty. It's time to worry about the whole machine." Unquote. So, it's time to call in the engineers. Economics is a question of production and delivery. Engineers are best qualified since they study the workings of the engine. Economists study the workings of the dial, the monetary reflection of our power. They say bolster the dollar and strangle the engine. Engineers say bolster the engine, bolster the dollar. The name of the engineer's game is to maximize production of the engine. The name of the economist's game is to maximize profit on the dial. Worse, the reading on the dial isn't even accurate. Their dial misrepresents the real wealth of the national economy and hence represents our real, misrepresents our real power. They constantly tell us that there is no money to do things that are desirable and physically possible. It's the same line they gave people during the Depression. There was no power to grow food, make clothes, houses, roll, um, cars, tractors. Then happened the war, and they found the power to grow new food for their boys, make them new clothes, new uniforms, house them in new barracks, arm them with new weapons, mount them on new tanks to take part in the European butchery. They had an industrial boom delivering bombs for free to the Germans when the year before they couldn't deliver food for free to themselves. Where'd the power come from to finance the war that would not finance production the year before? The answer is to be found in the faulty engineering design of the banking system. Bankers know that when they make a loan to an industrialist in order to, that he might get the financial power, allowing him access to the real power to build a factory, he would only use it a bit at a time as the plant gets built. Most of that money would find its way back to the bank as the people who receive the money in wages and sales put it in the bank. The bank then relends that same money to him over and over and over. The number of times it can be relent is called the banker's reserve ratio. It's their fudge factor. They make it up. It has nothing to do with the real state of affairs and is not in harmony with nature. Yet the economy of the 1920s experienced the boom because credit is as good a monetary medium as money in order to facilitate production. People were rich in real wealth, energy, factories, and goods. 
All real wealth is energy. It is the sum total of the energy expended in its fabrication. It is the cost in energy units of man, material, and tool, while interest is not an energy cost. This period of outstanding material prosperity experienced by the USA was terminated by the action of the Federal Reserve Banking System by foreclosing on most overdrafts. President Hoover drew attention to the disastrous consequences and requested reconsideration. He was ignored. He was just an engineer. What would he know? The demand of the banks for repayment in cash of loans that existed only as entries in their ledgers caused the financial credit system to collapse. Yet the real credit of the people hadn't changed. This proves that financial credit is a misrepresentation of the real credit. Those factories, raw materials, and skilled people were still there, but the money that represented them had disappeared. The people were so used to trusting their banker's money dial that when the dial read empty, they turned off their machines rather than check the engines. John von Neumann, one of this century's top mathematicians in his book, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, states that, quote, important economic questions in economics arise in a more elementary fashion in the theory of games, unquote. I will, not I will now examine the banking misrepresentations in the context of games. Any casino is an example of inflation-free banking at work. The casino banker knows that the fundamental rule for avoiding the inflation of his chips is to make sure that all wealth coming into the game gets its own chips to represent it. There is no limit to the number of chips issued so long as the wealth is stored to back them up. Present-day bankers violate this simple law of good accounting. They insist that savings, money already backed up by a previous set of goods, be used to represent a new set of goods. The investment of savings means the reappearance of the same money in a fresh set of prices for a fresh set of goods. There's almost more wealth on the table than there is money to represent it, since the same money represents old and new goods at the same time. All the goods cannot get bought, which explains the anomaly of a half-idle production system with a half-starving population. If we wish to now trade our wealth with other nations, we have an insufficient amount of money to accurately represent the wealth actually in our possession. This use of savings to finance new goods means that someone must deprive himself of his current purchasing power and hence creates his demand for interest. The industrialist who finances his plant with someone's savings must pay it back quicker than it depreciates, and when it is paid off, again, there is real wealth in the game, but no money to represent it, without mortgaging it, of course. Again, the barter of that wealth is hampered because it is unrepresented by money. Keeping money in short supply dilutes people into believing that wealth is in short supply. The flaw is in the dial and not in the engine. The arithmetic mistake in the unsafe engineering design of money was first presented at the 1929 World Engineering Congress in Tokyo in a paper by Clifford U. Douglas, B. Engineering, the founder of the social credit movement. And it was entitled, quote, The Application of Engineering Methods to Finance, unquote. In his book, quote, The Monopoly of Credit, unquote, he points out that, the most, that most financing is done not by savings, but by credit. Money born of a banker's pen. Well, new chips. There is an artificial limit placed on this financial power, and there shouldn't be a limit placed on new chips, just how much collateral you got. Our power is a function of what we have done, saved times the banker's fudge factor, and not a function of what we can do. In Arnold Tustin's book, The Mechanism of Economic Systems, he points out that, quote, time series methods used by economists may introduce unstable high-frequency modes that are essentially spurious, counterfeit, false, unquote. Methods used by engineers based on continuous functions, such as Laplace transformations, are free from this defect. The time series approach tends to obscure the significance of the general analytic form of the solution. All the misrepresentations and obscurities point to interest as the culprit. Interest is a non-linear function. When a man borrows from another man some money, if they both get into an accident and they both go into comas, 
Only when there is no interest in the relationship will the debt remain linear. And figure A, I have you know line going straight over time. The moment interest enters into the equation, the debt will double in time t. Double and double and double. And then double again in time t, and then again and again. Figure B, that's how an exponential function works. If it doubles and doubles and doubles, that's exponential. The crooked line is complicated, a straight line is simple. So maybe we should start the engineering party of Canada. You don't have to be an engineer to join, but you have to be able to think straight. People who believe in social credit already think straight. Bankers hook up this non-linear function to their money dial and marvel at the resultant misrepresentation of the real wealth in the game.